Yeah, come on, give him a good hand clap of praise. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. Woo, hallelujah. I said he's worthy of all praise and glory and honor forever and ever and ever. And amen. He's worthy. He's worthy. I look forward to moments that I get to use this vessel to give him praise. Amen. How many is ready for the word tonight? <clears throat> I want to share something that the Lord placed on me. I believe it was either Thursday evening or Friday. Leaving cemeteries for cities. Leaving cemeteries for cities. And most of our text is going to come from Mark chapter 5. You can look on the screen or you can read along in your Bible. Uh, but I believe God's going to give us some tremendous instruction and revelation tonight about deliverance and what God can do even today. Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. How many of you know there's still some unclean spirits around today? And they're at work. And they're trying to deceive. But the Bible continued in verse 3. He who had his dwelling among the tombs. You know, sometimes the places where we spend a lot of time indicate the direction we are headed. This man was headed straight toward death. And so he frequently stayed in a place that was a symbol of death. Matter of fact, when you hang out in the tombs, there's not much left to think about but the people who've gone on before you. And when you think about a graveyard, you know, there's not much future to it. Matter of fact, it's always focused on what used to be. Graveyard is a place of memories, but also a place where that change is impossible. It is a place where you can have zero effect on those around you. And here's a man who stayed in a place such as this. Tonight, I want to not just talk about this demoniac, but I also want to talk about us and ask, are there things in our lives that we need to be set free from? You know, sometimes it's easy to hang out in the past like the man did in the graveyard, and uh, live with what ifs and second guess what we should have done and what we could have done. But God wants to get you out of that graveyard of past regret and put you on a road to victory. Amen. That's his will. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ of God in Christ Jesus. You know, when Paul wrote this scripture, he had a lot of regrets. There were things he wished he could have changed. If he could have, he would have went back and made sure he never arrested any Christian. He would have made sure he didn't stand there and give his approval for the martyrdom and the stoning of the first martyr named Stephen. A lot of things he would have changed, but he realized hanging out in the graveyard did Paul no good. And so he decided, I'm going to get up from my past, as Sister Casey had mentioned, and instead of holding on to it and regretting, I'm going to do what God said, forget and leave those things behind. Can I get an amen? That's the will of God. He chose to let go and to move forward. The man who lived in the Gadarenes needed an inspiration to help get him out of a th way of thinking in which he was comfortable among the tombs. Somebody needed to come and provide him with inspiration and with hope. And so we continue to look here in verse 14. And no one could bind him. I'm sorry, verse 3. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. When I read this part about the man and how no one could tame him, it kind of reminds me of maybe something that's not quite as violent uh, where that some of you might relate a little better to. You've probably never broken chains into, but maybe you relate to this. It's called rebellious children. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Parents will place rules and expe expectations on their kids only to see them in just a few short years find a way to break almost every single rule you make. Some young people run away from home just to prove a point. They think, well, I'm going to show mom and daddy what I'm really made of, and they're not going to tell me what to do. But when they're sitting there staring through the window at Burger King watching somebody eat 
a golden, crispy, salted fry. And they realize mom and daddy used to always take care of that. And they're sitting there thinking, boy, I don't even have the money to buy me a, a small fry. They start realizing things weren't so bad when they lived at home. But rebellion drives us to an attitude like this man of the Gadarenes where that no man or woman can tame us. There are certain wives who expect their husband to be Mr. Handyman. And they'll watch the Home Improvement Channel and they'll see all these easy little things and they'll look at their husband and nudge him on the couch. Say, why don't you get up off that couch and go build us a shelf like that guy did in 15 minutes? You say, well, honey, because number one, I got to have the funds to buy the materials. Then I, I need more than 15 minutes. It's going to take me a while. Amen. They actually braked for commercials and did a whole lot and then came back and half of it was finished. <laughs> Sometimes we put so much expectation on our husbands that the husband literally rebels against your expectation. And he'll sit on the couch just for spite and not do anything. That's called a man who cannot be tamed. There are husbands who expect their wives to look like the supermodels that they see flashing across the screen and say, why don't you go to the gym and work out and look more like that woman right there? And she looks and says, well, why don't you look more like the man on the last commercial? <laughs> Women cannot be tamed when a man puts that type of pressure on them. And sometimes they rebel and eat a Debbie snack just because you don't want them to. They say, I'm not a honey bun, yeah. I'm not just going to eat one nutty bar. I'm going to eat two of them with a big glass of milk. How do you like that? Can't be tamed. We expect a lot of things of the people close to us, but the way that we approach people is just as important as the why for us approaching people. There's a way that is right. There's a way that is wrong. And I urge you, if you're married or in a relationship or if you have children, or even parents, to find a way to bring peace and to work together. But this man could not be tamed. Verse 5, and always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. The Bible tells us that this man stayed away from people. Did you know they feared him? I mean, I would fear him if I tried to put shackles and chains on him and he broke them as if they were toothpicks. That would concern me. And I would want him staying as far from me as he would. Here was a man who was feared. But I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. The devil literally threw those demons that possessed the man, drove him to a place of loneliness. Now, that's very important because oftentimes we will run toward loneliness when we need people more than we ever have. Pastor, I thought you was going to say when we need God more than ever. Well, you always need God, but whether you know it or not, there are certain times you need people. You need friends. You need brothers and sisters, folks you can call up, people you can depend on. I'll just say this from a pastor's point of view because most people don't expect the pastor to let off steam, but sometimes I need somebody to talk to. A lot of times it's my wife, maybe some, someone in the congregation here. You need somebody to talk to. This man, because of the demons that possessed him, was driven to a place where he had no communication. He was driven to a place where all he could do was possibly take rocks and carve out things on the, on the uh, tombstones possibly. But we also know based on scripture that he took those same rocks and he cut himself with stones. He got to a place where that he could not stand himself anymore. He had been driven to a point in his life where the demons made him hate himself and hate them. We've got to be careful that we don't get the attitude that I can handle this all by myself. That's very tempting. We'll go through a, a very serious situation. We'll say, oh, I got this. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to have anybody pray for me. I'm just going to deal with it. Me and God's going to handle it. And if you're strong enough, we'll praise the Lord for it. But most people need brothers and sisters that can bind with them and pray. Amen. Don't be afraid to get our other folks to carry your burden with you. Why would this man cut himself? Well, there's probably several reasons, but one reason is the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if there's one thing these demons wanted to do, it would be to deface the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, this man wasn't saved uh, based on his condition, so the Holy Ghost did not live in him, but he was built as a human to house the presence of Almighty God. 
And so these demons, through his anguish, were trying to get him to a place to say, well, even if God were to come up on shore, I will never be, oh, I'm talking right now. If God were to come up himself and step out of a boat onto the sandy seashore, I still would not be worthy of his forgiveness because I have marred the only precious gift that he has given unto me. I have uh, desecrated my temple that was meant for the Holy Ghost. So he had all these things working against him. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran. Somebody say, he ran. He ran and worshipped him. Now I want you to understand that there were two things at work. That was the will of man and there was the will of legion, the demons. The man ran toward Christ Jesus. But then we see that he cried out with a loud voice something that he had no knowledge of. Only the demons could have known this. They said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So the will of man and the will of the demons were in conflict with one another. He hated them and they hated him. Maybe you can relate to this in some ways. I don't think anybody in here is demon possessed or it would have already manifested with so much move of the Holy Ghost. But there are people in this room that deal with bondage of different types. Maybe it's something we consider insignificant, nothing big. I just kind of struggle with this, and every month, every couple of weeks, it pops back up, and, and I give in, and then I, I beat it back down into s subjection to the cross, Calvary, and Jesus, and then it comes back, and, and I'm just tired of it, Pastor, and I'm fed up with bondage, and I'm ready for freedom. That's the place this man had to get. And the man's side ran to Jesus when he saw him. You see, there's no way this man could have known when Jesus got out of the boat who he was just by his physical appearance with that distance between them. But I believe that there was something in the supernatural that revealed to this man, here comes your answer. Here comes one who's not like anybody who's ever approached you before. Here comes someone who, mm, glory, who instead of bringing chains rattling uh, over their shoulder with shackles and keys, instead of shackles and handcuffs and ropes that would bind you, here comes a man who will set you free. Those demons that torment you are no match for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm here to tell you tonight under the unction of the Holy Ghost that if you have brought anything with you, if you are bound, if there are things that you struggle with that I know someone stepping onto the shore this evening and he's brought with him not a way to control you but a way to set you free from the very bondage that you hate being under can somebody give me an amen hallelujah these demons had rebelled against God thousands of years before to follow Satan. But even now they recognize Satan was only a fallen angel, but there was only one most high God, and he stood on the seashore. So what did they do? They cried out, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The next time that the enemy comes against you to tempt you or to try to tear you down or mess you up, you begin thinking back to when those demons approached Jesus and he was just in the flesh. And even then they had to bow down to his will and beg him not to torment them. Just imagine now, Brother Hope, when a demon comes your way and he sees not something in the flesh, but he sees the power of the Holy Ghost, part of that divine trinity, staring it right back in the face. When that demon sees the power of the Holy Ghost, it has no chance of overcoming you as long as you live by this word amen verse 8 for he said to him come out of the man unclean spirit when you get fed up with your condition there is a God even tonight who's still ready to declare those words come out come off of release that person verse 9 then he asked him what is your name and he answered saying my name is legion for we are many also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain, so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. The next time that you are under attack, you remember the power of your God. Amen. And at once, verse 13, Jesus gave them permission. 
Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Verse 14, so those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Notice they didn't leave that part out. And about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. There's a lot of theories as to why Jesus allowed these demons to enter swine and to destroy them. I'm sure he understood their intent was to uh, choke the life out of those pigs or either the pigs just chose to commit suicide. They couldn't stand the demons. A lot of theories floating around. It's also possible that it really didn't hurt Jesus' feelings for them to be drowned because according to the old Jewish law, they were considered unclean and really had no business being in that area to begin with. A lot of theories there, but there's one I want to present to you that I believe firmly in, that God was about to use what happened with the pigs to confirm to the demoniac what was going on in the hearts of his city. I want you to think about that. God was going to use this as an illustration to expose the heart and intent of a city to a man who was about to be delivered. They needed a heart change. Verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Can't you relate to that? If you were the one who had been living among tombs, cutting yourself, crying out all night, and a man came to your shore and delivered you with just a few words, wouldn't you want to pack up and put your life vest on, pack a lunch in your $6 million man lunchbox case? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you is like, who in the world's that? Pull it up on YouTube. And hop on there with your little cute Care Bear thermos and say, I'm ready to follow you anywhere you go, Jesus. He wanted to travel with the Messiah. See, he wasn't through seeing the good things. He was like, man, I, I've got to follow you and see what else you've been up to, Jesus. But Jesus, however, did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. Sometimes our plans do not match God's plans. Sometimes we want to hit the road and go evangelize like Reinhard Bunke and have 100,000 people in one gathering in Africa. And God says, wait a minute, I want you to go knock on your neighbor's door. I want you to invite them to church. I want you to let them know that you're here to be a blessing. You're praying for them. Is there anything they need? Let them know Jesus loves them. Sometimes God asks of us the very thing we need to do, but the very opposite of what we want to do. Everyone enjoys the thoughts of standing up before congregations. Well, some don't, but a lot of people like that thought and preaching the gospel. But sometimes God says, I want you just to be a faithful usher. I want you to be a deacon. I want you to be a, a Sunday school teacher, a drama team member, or a praise band singer, or musician. Whatever God asks of you, it's what you need to pursue because it will always be the perfect plan. The man wanted to go with Jesus, but the Lord wouldn't allow him to do it. The influence of Christ upon this man would be more than Jesus could do himself. What are you talking about? Well, the people, they got upset about the pigs, and they let him know, we need you to depart from here. We don't want you here. When people are begging you to leave, Brother Gary, it's very likely they're probably not going to book you for a revival. They're not going to say, hey, we got a synagogue down the road here. We want you to come speak. No, they were running Jesus out of town because of the pigs. And yet Jesus, when the man approaches him and says, can I please go with you, Lord? He says, no, I want you to go home. Go back to your friends and let them know what the Lord has done for you. See, Jesus knew that there was a place called the Decapolis, 10 cities, major places of commerce. And he knew that although he could not physically go and reach the people and make a difference, that there was a man who had just been set free that had roots in those towns. And when he sent him back, he was going to tell and to show them what God had, did, had done for him. Now, can I go down a, a little lonely road right quick? 
You can't show people <laughs> a difference, <clears throat> the difference that Jesus makes unless you can show them a difference in your life. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me I can't just go preach a strip and hand out my cute little tracks? Tells people get saved, you're going to burn and leave them on the toilet at the mall. You tell me, you tell me that ain't all I, I have to do. No, in order for people to understand Jesus is a God of change, you need to show them he made a difference in you. There's a lot of folks don't want to live by the word of God, but yet they want to get up and preach. Hypocrites. That's all that is, people getting up and saying, well, you ought to get right with God. You ought to quit sinning. You ought to lay down temptation and lay down sin, start living holy, and yet they're going out and doing things, they, you know, and God knows they shouldn't. That's hypocritical. What God wanted to show the people of the Decapolis is a man with a difference in him. The Bible tells us that he sat there clothed and in his right mind. Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 50, verse 15. I don't have this on the screen. It says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. When did he say call me? He said, Call on me in the day of trouble. He said, I'm going to deliver you. Anybody ever experienced deliverance by God's mighty hand? Amen? He said, I'll deliver you. So what did Jesus tell him to do? Go back home. Show and tell what I've done for you. Here's what the man showed the cities. He showed the cities of the Decapolis that he had traded cutting his flesh for crucifying his flesh. He showed them that he gave up crying at night for joy in the morning. He showed them that he traded the torment of demons for the presence of Almighty God. And he showed them that he left the darkness of the cemetery to carry the light to the cities. Can I get an amen? You know, the cities wanted to help this man. They chained him in order to control him. They thought they were helping but instead, based on what Jesus showed him <clears throat> through the swine, they tried to help this man, stand with me, by doing things that were only within the realm of human help. But Jesus showed by the illustration of the swine, man, I want you to see that what the real problem is is a heart condition in these ten cities because they're more concerned about their 2,000 pigs than they are one man being set free. There's a lot of people still like that in this world. They care more about wealth than they do people being delivered. There's a lot of churches that get so hung up on don't mess up our schedule, on don't mess up our pretty church coming in here, you homeless self or you druggie or you prostitute or whatever you're doing. And people, they get so upset when folks that are worldly come in needing help and yet they, it upsets them because it kind of shakes up that nice little facade that they have. But God wants a real church. He wants a church where people can be delivered and set free. And it won't come from a facade. I'm going to tell you where it'll come from. It'll come through people who know what it's like to be different, to be set apart, and to be delivered. Amen? Jesus is coming soon. I want to give you an opportunity tonight. If there's an area in your life and you're saying, God, I want to lose some things. I want to let go of some things. I want to let you have your way, dear Jesus. I want you to be Lord of every bit of my life. If that's you, I want you to come up to this altar. I'm going to pray with you. and There's going to be some that will come behind you and pray with you. God's going to do a miracle tonight, just like he moved on behalf of this man. He set this guy free. There's some things, and we, sometimes we think, well, I heard that story about that demoniac, and I'm nowhere near as bad as that. And I'm not even insinuating that, but there's just some issues that God knew about when he gave me this word, and he was going to set free. Deliverance comes by obedience. We're going to pray, and God's going to move, but the true deliverance is coming through a decision that you're going to make, that I'm going to choose to walk away from whatever it is that binds me. I'm going to consciously make a decision that I will no longer walk in this. Now, here's what God does. When he sees you've got a made-up mind, he accompanies that made-up mind with supernatural strength and power to overcome. That's what God's about to do in this place. If you will, come up behind these, and we're going to pray. And God's about to do some miraculous things. Amen. And if some of you are coming up here and you need prayer too, you just 
let us know. We're going to pray for all of you that want prayer. But those that will, come up behind and help me pray.